Okay, part five. I'll try and make this a bit longer than last time. Selling the materials. I asked Gil to contact Benno upon my return to the temple, and he took a letter to the Gilberta Company on the next sunny day. It seemed that Benno did not have as much work in the winter, so I got a nigh immediate response stating that he would be ready to meet with me that same afternoon. In that case, I shall prepare the orphanage director's chambers for his visit. Please inform Lutz of this. As you wish, Gil replied. Lutz went back for lunch with my reply, and at fifth bell, the Gilberta Company arrived. Benno, Mark, and Lutz were all in attendance. We headed straight into my hidden room, at which point I leaped onto Lutz, having barely seen him over the winter. Then, while my internal batteries recharged, I mentioned to Benno that I wanted him to sell my teaching materials in the castle. Sorry, what? You want to sell them in the castle? Hold on a moment. But we don't have a moment to spare. They need to go on sale as soon as possible. Quit thinking so literally. What I was going to say was my current employees aren't well trained enough to go to the castle right now. Then why don't you do it, dude? The Gilberta Company was primarily doing business with lay nobles while slowly spreading out to med nobles and arch nobles. My connections had already secured them one high-ranking customer in the form of Elvira. But as one could guess from the fact that only Benno and Mark ever brought goods to her, they barely had any employees who were capable enough to visit the castle, even those who had manners hurriedly beaten into them in preparation for serving in the Italian restaurant weren't completely ready. Employees, huh? What if you were to bring some of my attendants and great priests dressed as servants, then? We're just selling products here, not taking orders, so anyone who can do math should be just fine. When doing business with nobles, it was standard for everything to be made to order. Outside of consumable goods like plant, pa like plant paper, one would need never just bring and sell pre-made products. Even the rin sham was being specifically catered to the arch nobles using it. Benno would bring them various samples made from seasonal ingredients and scrubs, then take orders based on their preferred combinations. I personally just purchased the samples, but to maintain my arch noble pretense, I filled out the order form and pretended they were being tailor-made for me. You're just going to outright sell what you've been making as winter handiwork. You're not going to take custom orders from the nobles in the castle, Ben asked his eyes wide. I nodded, yes, we're just going to sell them as is, but we need to act quickly. You and Mark can handle the orders from nobles who want more customized products, but we'll sell the books outright to those who'd rather have them right away. For that, any great priests who are good at math will be acceptable. All right. On our end, we've got Mark, Leon, and me. We'll need you to choose two adult great priests to help out, though, and you'll want clothes prepared for them before taking them to the castle, right? We naturally couldn't take the great priests to the castle in their robes. Instead, we would use we need proper sets of clothing for them to wear so that they would blend right in with the Gilberta Company. Gil, who do you think would be good for this job? Fran is already going to be carrying the chalices, so we only need one more person. Fritz once served a blue priest, so he should do just fine. Oh, yeah, um, someone actually commented that Fran had not told her who he, Fritz had served before, which is probably a good thing, though I don't think that would be that big of a deal. But let me know what y'all think. <sighs> oh. In that case, I shall ask Fran and Fritz for their help. Having settled on our new salesman, it was time to determine the price and quantity of our products. I think we can price the picture books at one small gold each, the card to sets at five large silvers, the black and white playing cards at three large silvers, and the colored playing cards at one small gold, I suggested. Given that we had successfully lowered the cost of plant paper and ink since selling the initial picture books aimed at rich people, we could reduce the price of our new books without issue. The card to sets used mimeograph printing, as Wilma naturally could not draw them all herself. And as these were made from wood, they were cheaper to produce than, put, than books. As for the decks of playing cards, these had even fewer components than the Carto, which was why the black and white variants was our cheapest product. The ones that were in color, however, while very pretty, were also a lot more costly due to the rarity of the ink. For this reason, they were targeted toward arch nobles who wanted to make their high status clear. For now, let us prepare a hundred of each. That should be enough, considering how many kids there are. Got it. I'll load wooden crates with a hundred of each. With that matter settled, sorted, we started discussing the best way to go about selling our goods. The biggest problem was that we were dealing with nobles here, which meant the sales methods used on commoners might not work. Mark left partway through to begin preparations early, and once we were done, Mark, Benno got Franz and Fritz's measurements for their clothes and started showing them the ropes. Meanwhile, Gil and Lutz went to the workshop to check the products and start boxing them up. 
As this went on, I noticed that Daniel was wearing a tight frown, looking down a little in silence as the Gilberta company busily moved about. It was the same depressed expression that I had seen on Feline's face back in the playroom. What's wrong, Daniel? I asked. If you have noticed something important, please feel free to tell me. It's possible that you know things that none of us do. There was still a lot about this world's culture that I did not know, and while Benno was doing business with nobles, the fact that he was a commoner meant that this would be the, his first time entering the castle. Assu assuming that Daniel had picked up on the, an issue that only nobles would notice, it was possible that we could end up making a huge mistake while doing business unless he said something here. Well, what I noticed is that while your picture books are quite lovely, Lady Rosemine, and cheaper than other books, they are still too expensive for a lay noble family to comfortably afford. I am just worried that there are going to be many children who feel frustrated and inferior to the others. I say this as someone who personally comes from a noble family on the poorer side. It was common knowledge here that poor lay nobles generally had even less money than rich commoners, and I hit my, bit my lip in frustration having not remembered such a simple fact. The picture books made learning easy, but the kids who needed them most were those who were too poor to have skilled teachers. Even here, the amount of money that one's family had would have a huge impact. I understand that not all the nobles are going to be able to buy the books, but we cannot lower the price any further than we already have, I said, po politely noticing Benno shooting me a glare mid-sentence. He would never approve of reducing prices for nobles and considering our future business plan, it would not be wise to sell them at a loss from the very start. It is true that the price is already much lower than it could be, I mused, but I think it would be smart to think of a way for everyone who wants a book to be able to get one. Let's, do you have any ideas? I think the only solution is to lend a book so to those who can't buy them. Books were expensive, so expensive that just owning them was a sign of one's wealth. For that reason, both buying and borrowing them was no simple matter. The temple's book room was made such that only members of the temple could enter, and one not only had to be a blue priest or a blue shrine maiden to borrow them from it, but they also needed the high bishop's or high priest's permission. To enter the castle's book room, one first needed to provide evidence that they were of a high enough status. Those who wanted to borrow a book would then need to pay a large deposit, which would be used as collateral to cover the cost of any damages, such as the pages being torn or dirtied. Earth's ideal, uh, ideal of a library lending books out for free was just unthinkable here. Right now, borrowing books isn't easy, but what if we thought about this as a challenge to change that culture and make the process more accessible, Love suggested. I paused and thought for a moment. If the problem is the collateral being too high, perhaps we could just lower it? We could make the rental fees cheap and have the parents agree to pay money in the event of damage. This would be somewhat of an abuse of authority, but I could imagine that the parents would ensure the books were treated well, since they were borrowing them from me, the Archduke's adopted daughter. This would also guarantee that they paid up in the case that any books unfortunately did get damaged. Perhaps we can make the rental fee a small sum in the exchange of a new story. I had it thinking back to the tales that Feline and the other girls had told me. Were I to pay the, for the stories, it would probably allow even those too poor to buy the books to rent them instead. I think you should consider the length of the story here, too. Some might be a lot longer than others. True. I'll consider that when purchasing them, I said. By calculating the payments based on the length of each manuscript and having the kids write them out, everything would hap hap hopefully work out. I would get new stories, and the kids with poor handwriting skills would get an opportunity to practice and earn money. I was killing three birds with one incredibly clever stone, but just as I was starting to pump myself up, I noticed Benno's mouth twitching. Lady Rosemine, we are dealing with considerable sums of money here. I do not believe it is wise to change established practices based on sudden whims. Please settle on an idea only after discussing it with the high priest and making the proper preparations, he said, his dark red eyes brimming with an anger that seemed to say, Don't give me extra work when I'm already so busy I could die. I had more than enough experience by now to know that I was about five seconds away from being on the receiving end of some miraculous indoor thunder. Thunder that no doubt would have already been unleashed had I not been the oh-so-noble adopted daughter of the Archduke. I suppose I get, should give the idea of paying for manuscripts some more thought before implementing it. For now, we can simply lower rental fees. Oh ho ho, I said to avoid, I said to avoid Benno's anger, writing all that down into the diptych in my heart. I would consider renting the manuscripts, materials to lay nobles, as the foundation for a future book rental business or my private library. A day that we were due to sell our products came in what felt like the blink of an eye. I followed my pan for my panda bus at the temple's front entrance and watched as everyone piled luggage into it, and soon enough, it was packed full of wooden crates containing a hundred of each of the cards, sets, picture books, and playing deck cards. 
Since Fran and Fritz were going to be accompanying us from as merchants from the Gilberta Company, Benno had given them clothes similar to what Mark and Leon had on. While Fran was used to wearing normal clothes when visiting the lower city, Fritz looked uneasy and uncomfortable in them. Rosemine, do you in truly intend to have those of the Gilberta Company ride in this? Ferdinand asked, frowning as he looked at my dear sweet Leslie. Well, it's snowing outside. The carriage might get stuck along the way if we send them out, don't we think? I said, pointing out the thick layer of snow covering the ground. Ferdinand crossed his arms and looked toward between the snow and the merchants. Your argument is a sound one, but no other noble in Arenvest would allow merchants and their products to ride on their high beasts. That's okay. I'm fully prepared to become a trailblazer in everything I do, remember? In everything I do. Remembered in history forevermore as a source of all trends. No future nobles are going to follow your example. You will stand alone in history, he shot back with a sigh before looking over at the others. Fran Fritz. I imagine it's not easy being forced to accommodate the whims of your master, but I trust you both to do your best. As for you, Benno, I understand the stress you feel better than anyone, but to walk with Rose mind, it is to deal with the countless ideas she spouts forth from seemingly nowhere. This is a fate you chose yourself, and you must resign yourself to it. At that, everyone glanced my way, then gave solemn, defeated nods. Should I be concerned about how easily everyone just accepted that? I mean, you're all sticking with me because you want to, not because you're resigned to your fates or whatever. Right? I puffed out my cheeks in a pout, but nevertheless opened the doors of my panda bus for them. If you've all finished with your preparations, feel free, please feel free to enter. Fran climbed in first since he was already used to doing so, followed by Benna, who was wearing the grimace of someone who had just seen something downright creepy. Mark had his usual smile on his face, while Lutz started touching Leslie all over and making surprise noises as soon as he was inside. Fritz, in contrast, looked extremely fearful as he got in. Uh-oh. Even yelping in surprise when I shut the door. Oh boy. Everyone, please fasten your seatbelts. Fran, teach them how to. As you wish, Fran replied, and while he showed them, Bridget climbed into the front passenger seat. It was apparently essential that I bring a guard with me since I was traveling with merchants. Once we were soaring through the sky and Leslie, the back seats got noisy. It made, me, made sense given that it was normally unthinkable that a commoner would ever have the opportunity to fly. But most of them were saying things like, I feel sick or I'm getting dizzy. Based on how overjoyed Mar Gil and Nicola had been when they rode in my panda bus, it was safe to say that the negative reaction was due to today's riders, mostly being hard-headed older men. Welcome home, Lady Rosemine. Norbert began upon my arrival, only to stop and widen his eyes when he saw just how many people were coming out of my high beast. As expected to a regular noble, the idea of my high beast being full of commoners was genuinely shocking. He watched them unload the crates, closed his eyes, and then took a very deep breath. Lady Rosemine, are these the men from the Gilberta Company? That's right. This is the permit given to me by Ob Ehrenfest. Norbert, we should be heading straight to the playroom. Please guide us there if you would. Norbert paused for a split second, then smiled, as you wish. Please follow me. Ferdinand, having just finished putting away his high beast, massaged his temples and let out a heavy sigh. Rosemine, this is not the door for commoners. There is a separate entrance for merchants and the like. Ah, uh, of course, commoners wouldn't use the same entrance as no members of the Archducal family, I thought. Dejectedly hanging my head, there was something I should have known by now. I used a different gate than the merchants when entering the noble's quarter, so it only made sense that I would also use a different one to enter the castle. Merchants were supposed to enter through the commoner door that was used by servants and such. Um, sorry, I, uh, I trailed off, not even knowing what to say. Ferdinand shook his head. Apologies, Norbert. I did not realize that Rosemine intended to fly the merchants here in her high beast until I saw her preparing to do that, not moments, that just, to do just that moments prior. It was too late to arrange for carriages, and now here we are. Rosemond, you can be forgiven this time, but take care not to repeat this mistake in the future. My apologies again, Norbert, but I ask that you take him through this door just this once. As you wish, Lord Ferdinand. I got into one, my one-person panda bus and followed Norbert and Ferdinand. The members of the Gilberta Company were close behind me, carrying the crates of merchandise. Good morning, Lady Rosemond, the kids all said once I arrived. Good morning, everyone. It will take some time for us to prepare, so you are welcome to play among yourselves until we are ready. The kids were looking at me with the same hopeful eyes as always, and I could see that there were many parents here as well. They had probably considered this a perfect opportunity to establish connections with me. You're late, Rosemine, Wilfried said with his arms crossed and head held high. I had asked him to help me with selling the goods today, and since I was, it was his first time being entrusted with work, he was getting a little too excited about it. Wilfried, please play Karata with the others as demonstrations for the adults. This is a very important job since they are less, more likely to buy something when they understand how to use it. That makes sense to me. Let's play then, Wilfred explained to his followers who all energetically agreed and started build, lining up the karta. The nobles gathered around and watched the boys' karta demonstration with great interest. This meant that the girls were being left with nothing to do, however, so I called out to them. 
May I ask you all to read the picture books aloud to your fathers and mothers, they asked. That way they will see just how much your reading skills have, have developed. As you wish, Lady Rosemine, the girls chattering with gleeful voices raced over to their parents with the picture books hugged to their chests. Then they started to read aloud. I could hear the tension creeping into their voices as they began since they were used to being read too rather than the other way around. And Cornelius, please play a game of cards with your friends, I said, handing him a pack. But I am your guard, he said, looking at them unhappily. Unfortunately for him, though, out of all my retainers present, he was the only one able to mingle with the students. Since Angelica is not here today, you are the only student I have. I'm counting on you here. Okay, I understand. I suppose I am the only person for the job, then. I shall do as you wish. Angelica had yet to return from the Royal Academy, so I had nobody else to ask. Cornelius did as instructed, pulling aside some students and starting a game of blackjack with slightly modified rules, at which point the nearby adult nobles gathered around to watch. While they were focused on the demonstrations, I shifted my attention to the Gilberta Company and signaled for them to begin preparations. I could see that stands had been set up in one corner, as we had requested, so I took the opportunity to thank the attendants in charge of the playroom. I see the stands are all prepared. Thank you. Now, Benno, line up the products if you would be so kind. As you wish, Lady Rosemine. Benno lined up the products on the stands as we had previously discussed, then readied enough change to make the payment process easier. There were two chairs and a table by the stands, which was where Wilfried and I would be willing to speak to the nobles who wanted to buy the teaching materials. At the far end of the room was a chair for Ferdinand placed so that he could see the entirety of the room and observe the sales process. He would be watching all of us like a hawk, keep track of the nobles' behavior, whether the Gilberta Company was good enough to return to the castle at a future date, and whether I was about to make a foolish mistake. While we were in the preparation phase, he walked around and observed each demonstration with great interest. Leon was standing at the playing card stand, Fran at the picture book stand, and Fritz at the cards stand, while Benno and Mark stood behind my table, ready to speak to any nobles who wanted to engage in more detailed business discussions. Lady Rosemont, everything is ready, Benno said. I nodded, waiting for Wilfried to win his current game, then addressed the room. Thank you for your patience, everyone. The Gilberta Company will now begin selling the teaching materials. At that, Wilfred pushed the responsibility of clearing up the car to onto, up onto the kid beside him, raced over, and sat in the chair beside me. Those of you interested in making a purchase, please come right over. I continued with a smile. As we are selling teaching materials here, we shall prioritize customers who have children with them. It wasn't long before the nobles started to approach our stand, naturally coming forth in order of their status. The first kid walked over with her father, then they both kneeled. The children all ha had all introduced themselves to me previously, but the parents had not, so they all needed to open with the appropriate long greeting. These greetings were so long that I would not be able to handle them all myself, which is why I had asked Wilfried to help out. It became evident rather quickly that there were more boys with their parents lined up in front of Wilfred, while more girls were queued up in front of me. They had probably figured that this gave them the best chance of eventually becoming our retainers. Maybe. Once the first long introduction was over, I instructed the father and daughter to stand, then held out an order slip. What would you like to buy today, Guy Groschel? My daughter assures me that your picture books are beyond lovely, Lady Rosemine, and she believes her little sister would be interested in the cards and cards as well. Who am I to deny my beloved daughter what they so desire? I shall buy them all, he said, taking a pen and smiling as he looked down at his daughter, who was poring over the order slip. The girl gave a proud grim, her distinctive crimson hair bobbing up and down slightly as she giggled in satisfaction. Lady Rosemine, your picture books are very easy to read. You may read them as well, Father. I smiled broadly at her praising her at her praising for praising the books, checking the form, and then handed over to Benno. Here are your goods, Benno said, handing the Count Groschel's attendants the ordered products in exchange for the required amount of money, and that was that. I pray that they will assist you in your learning. Thank you, Lady Rosemine. Once Count Groschel had left, the next noble stepped forward. I glanced to the side as I listened to another grading to see Wilfried handling the noble for, her, for him with a confident attitude. He took the order form and gave it to order slip and gave it to Mark. Gib Kernberger, everything being sold here is perfect for studying. Thanks to those materials, I learned all of my letters and the names of the gods. Keep your kids focused and they'll learn too. Thank you for your advice, Lord Wilfrey. Gradually, the long lines waiting to be served by Wilfrey and me starting to go down. As expected, only the arch nobles with their riches could afford to buy all of the teaching materials. When we reached the men nobles, most seemed to be primarily interested in the cards and cards because all their children could play together with them. Fewer of them purchased the picture books given how expensive each volume was, instead prioritizing the card as a cheaper option for learning about the gods. Then when it came time for the lay nobles, most only purchased one product, seemingly having struggled to afford even that. It would all appear to be worthwhile though, the kids were burning with motivation as they clutched their card or playing cards determined to win next year. But then there was also several children who had nothing at all, 
forced to env enviously watch the kids who had been bought teaching materials for their by the parents. It seemed that those who knew from the start that they would not be able to afford anything had not wasted time asking their parents at all. Among the sad-looking kids was Feline. Feline, did your parents not come today, I asked? No, they were busy today, it seems, she said with a forced smile. The nearby kids without parents all looked away, not wanting to admit the same. I see. Well, at the end of winter, we shall be loaning out the picture books and cards are presently in use. So now is the time to discuss borrowing them with your parents. Lady Rosemont, I appreciate the thought, but... Feline trailed off, trailed off her lips, trembling a little as she struggled to say that she did not even have the money for that. Just so you know, you won't need money to borrow teaching materials from me. What? Everyone said, looking up with surprised expressions. I smiled a little at their expected reaction, then put a hand over my mouth and lowered my voice to make it sound like I was staring a secret. What I want are stories that I don't already know. Please gather all kinds from me. Um, would, would stories like the ones my mother told me count? Yes, Feline, you have already taught me those three stories. Thus, I shall lend you three picture books. First, Feline, then all the other lay noble's children lit up with joy. Lady Rosemont, will you lend me a card to set as well in exchange for some stories I know? Of course, as long as I don't already know the story. Consider the card to set yours, but take care not to get the materials dirty or break them. You will be charged if something happens to them. Okay. I would have the parents sign an agreement saying that they would treat the goods well and pay for any damages. In, in return for being told new stories, I would lend them the teaching materials from spring until next winter. Because I think by that point, everybody else would already have their own set, so they wouldn't have to worry about having them in the playroom anymore. So she can't afford to learn them out. Angelica and the Coming of Spring Selling the teaching materials went well. Elvira arrived as we were finishing and brought one of everything for Cornelius. Then, with a smile, she ob obliquely informed Benno that she was running low on Rinsham and wanted him to visit again so that she could order more. Of course, an arch noble such as her doing direct business with the Gilberta Company drew a lot of attention. <laughs> He's going to get more business! Benno returned the smile and nodded, but his eyes seemed to be wavering a little. He was in the castle with dozens of nobles paying close attention to him. There was certainly an immense amount of pressure on him right now. I knew exactly how he felt since the same thing had happened to me during my baptism ceremony and winter debut. Good luck, Benno. Once we were done selling the teaching materials, several married women came forward also hoping to purchase Rinsham, so Benno and Mark started doing business with them as best they could. Ferdinand, I would like to visit Ab Aaron Fest to inform him of the sales have finished and to bring him what we previously discussed. I shall handle that. You stay here, Ferdinand replied looking at Benno and Mark. He then had an attendant pick up the box of chalices and follow him to Sylvester's office. Meanwhile, Fran, Fritz, and Leon were cleaning up the meat remaining products and handling the money we had earned. Once the last of the sales had been made and dis business discussions were over, I took the Gilberta Company back to the temple along with Fran and Fritz. I stayed there for just one night and immediately returned to the castle. I will be giving a report on the sales later. The next day in the playroom, I told the kids to write their names on the teaching materials they had bought so that they wouldn't lose them. Since they had identical copies of the same product, labeling them to distinguish who owned what was pretty basic stuff. Please write your name or family name here for the playing cards, here for the carta, and here for the picture books. As the products are made to look the same, steps must be, must be taken to avoid mistaking someone else's belongings for your own. Some kids worked together with their siblings to write their family name, while the archnoble children who had bought everything sighed at that monotonous task. At the monotonous task ahead, I quickly picked up on this, and they were all very visibly relieved when I said they could just write their names on what they were using at the moment, leaving the rest for their family to help with when they returned home later in the day. As we will only be using the picture books today, you need only write your names in the books you have. I kept an eye on the playroom while the, listening to the lay noble children and writing down the stories they told me. Up until now, I had only heard tales from the girls, so this was my first time hearing something from the boys. It was pretty funny how they would often pause in confusion and mid-sentence and then hurriedly make up the next developing on the spot. Some of the things they came up with were genuinely hilarious. Spring was getting ever closer, and even with the flurries of snows, there were far more sunny days than before. This naturally meant there were more days when the kids went to play outside. I joined them as well, hoping to increase my stamina. The snow had been packed down in the spots where nobles typically landed their high beasts, and those areas were now surrounded by large mounds that were perfect for sledding down. My plan was to join in with that and the snowball fights. Let's go, Lady Rosemine, the kids would exclaim, and while I did my best to race after them, I always ended up falling flat on my face after just a few steps through the snow. I eventually resigned myself to walking instead, but and even then, it wasn't long before I was back on the ground, with the kids going for, getting further and further away. 
Despite my many valiant attempts, I did not reach the top even once. I was so exhausted that I had to give up on sledding, but when I went bent over to make a snowball, I was immediately sniped in the head with a presumptive strike that knocked me unconscious and caused a fever. That was the end of my first snowball fight. That is, assuming you were generous enough to call it one. That said, I do feel stronger now, like a foot soldier forced to march through the marsh. Marsh through the snow. Yeah. Such was how I spent my days as the end of winter approached, since the coming of age ceremony and the Royal Academy's graduation ceremony were coming up. The Archduke and Archduchess, the students who had finished their lessons early, and the parents of the graduating students all went to the Royal Academy. They would come back together once the ceremony was over, at which point the nobles would collectively build, hold a large feast, celebrating the return of spring and marking the end of winter socializing. The land-owning nobles would then all be returning to the provinces they ruled. Prior to the feast, while the students were returning from the Royal Academy one by one, I received a humble, deferential letter from Angelica's parents, requesting to meet in person. I was surprised to see them ask so directly, given how much they had groveled before, but despite my confusion, I accepted and arranged a date. On the day of, I entered to find Angelica dealing with her parents. She was in between them with her head facing the ground. No sooner had I stepped inside and Riarda shut the door behind me than her parents let out desperate cries of remorse. We expressed our sincerest apologies for what has occurred. Um, what might you be referring to? Our ineptitude at parenting has once again placed a burden on you. They apologized, sounding so much more desperate than last time that I couldn't help but blink in surprise. I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. They clasped their stomachs and with deathly pale looks on their faces began to explain. To sum things up, Angelica had failed to pass this, ne this year's courses at the Royal Academy. I believe that you can simply do as you like, Milady. Here, Milady, it's up to you whether you wish to, de to deem her a failure and have her removed from your service or keep her and hope that she will improve. It seemed that as Angelica's mistress, I can make decisions such as this about my only at my own leisure. What would you like to me to do, Angelica? I asked. You wouldn't mind me continuing to serve you? She asked, looking surprised. I nodded. If you work hard and return successful at the end of spring, I would like to keep you in my service. My words prompted Angelica's parents to look at each other with worry. Lady Rosemine, we are aware that you are a deeply compassionate woman, but it will not be benefit you to keep our daughter by your side. You do not need a retainer who only damages your reputation. Please rethink this decision. It was probably the right thing for a tenant serving the Archducal family to say. It was very noble-like to remove those who were deemed incompetent as the interest, in the interest of expanding your family's influence, but I did not like that mindset. My family had cared for me no matter how weak and useless I was, or seeing, so seeing this kind of reaction from the nobles actually made me a little upset. I appreciated that Angelica's parents were thinking about what was best for me, but I wanted them to think about what was best for their daughter, too. This is probably just me being selfish and refusing to adopt to a noble principles, but still, those are my feelings. Warfeet's attendants and guard knights had been as bad as could be, yet I had still given them an opportunity to redeem themselves. I wanted to give Angelica that same chance. I shall take your words to heart, and I would like to see how Angelica is doing at the end of spring before making my decision, I replied, shaking my head as I shot down their pleas. They looked between Angelica and me with openly defeated expressions and bowed their heads in respect, as you wish. The children in the playroom were able to memorize the names of the gods over the winter, so I am sure that Angelica will do just fine, I said, standing up and gesturing for her parents to leave. Once they were gone, I immediately established the first ever Raise Angelica's Grade Squadron, which consisted of all my guard knights, whether she li they liked it or not. We would be discussing what classes she was going to take, what problems she had encountered, and what she was struggling to understand. There weren't any attendants or scholars in this squadron, since they would not have a proper grasp of what knights needed to learn. And since men could not enter my room, our first strategy meeting would be held in the meeting room. Angelica, what classes are you struggling with? I asked. Students in the Royal Academy were told their grades directly rather than receiving report cards or the like, so asking her was the only way to find out what she needed help with. My plan was to start by focusing on her weakest points. Angelica's dark blue eyes gleamed, pretty much all the written lessons she answered eagerly. A feeling of mutual despair instantly crushed down upon everyone in the room. Bridget tightly closed her eyes and Daniel dropped his jaw. Angelica, that's just... Bridget began before trailing off uncomfortably. The written lessons aren't that hard, though, are they? Daniel asked. He had decided to become a knight since his older brother was already a scholar, but academics still seemed to be a strong point. As a lay noble without much mana, he instead struggled more with the hands-on practical lessons than the written ones. Um, Angelica, what classes are you taking? I'm not sure, Angelica replied, cocking her head to the side. Are you kidding me? How do you not know your classes? Cornelius' eyebrows shot up in anger. 
Someone your age should be memorizing the names of the gods and studying the four fundamentals of warfare. Are you even attending lessons? That wouldn't surprise me if she's not, to be honest. She did say she hates studying. Angelica was a third-year student at the Royal Academy, and yet out of everyone here, she knew the least about her own classes. Even Cornelius knew more about she no more about more than she did, and that was only because he had looked into what he would be learning next year. I felt a profound bomb with Ferdinand, and I was as I was overwhelmed with a sudden urge to rub my temples. <laughs> He's rubbing off on you a little bit. Daniel, Bridget, Cornelius, would you be so kind as to give an exact description of what her classes cover? I asked since it would be pointless to ask Angelica anything else. Bridget and Daniel's memories, alongside Cornelius's research, would be a lot more reliable than anything she had to say. Of course, milady, they all replied, going on to tell me exactly what I wanted to know. Okay, so to sum everything up, all third years need to memorize the names of them and domains of the gods, then acquire the divine protection of the ones most compatible with them. As a knight, she also needs to learn the fundamentals of warfare, as well as the different types of weapons and how to use them, correct? There is much more to learn if you look at the individual classes in more detail, but as long as you focus on those areas, there is nothing to worry about. I truly don't understand how she could fail, Daniel said, shaking his head in confusion. While he had struggled with the practical lessons, he had passed all the written ones with flying colors. Bridget nodded in agreement. She was more of an average student, being reasonably proficient in both written and practical lessons, so she hadn't really struggled with anything in the academy. Cornelius was probably the closest to Angelica, who was so reliant on his mana and getting good grades in practical lessons that he struggled comp comparatively more with the written ones, but even so, as an arch noble, he made sure to maintain grades that would not bring shame to his family. Given that there are grades, can I assume there are tests, I asked? Yes, students are given an explanation of what each class is about, then a test. Those who fail must take the class, and then a final exam, Daniel explained, earning him a glare from Bridget. And yet you never attended one of those final exams, did you? She asked, placing her hands on her hips. I told him I had in confusion. What do you mean, Bridget? If you have mastered what the class is about, you can schedule a meeting with the professor during their office hours and take the final exam early. I used all my spare time practicing the practical lessons, but even after finishing the written ones sooner than expected, I still could not learn the Royal Academy before the end of winter. It seemed that those who had older brothers and sisters willing seniors in the Royal Academy dorms or just great confidence in themselves could study outside of class to finish them early. That explained why some students returned to the castle significantly sooner than others. If you manage to secure some free time, you can spend it strengthening your weapons, learning to make magic tools, or taking other classes that you are interested in, Daniel continued. Some take this opportunity to deepen their relationships with other duchies. I could guess that Ferdinand had blasted through his classes with godlike momentum. It was easy to imagine him taking a bunch of tests at once, passing them all, and then being heralded as a genius by everyone. He wouldn't acknowledge this praise, of course, since he would be entirely focused on his next classes. He would. He definitely seems like the type that he would do that. So she just needs to attend the classes and pass the next exams, right? In that case, Angelica, please study alongside Cornelius. This way, he would also have no trouble passing when he takes the test next year. I don't mind, but Cornelius looked at Angelica with concern. Lady Rosemine, will you be using those cards of yours to teach her the names of the gods? That's right, Cornelius. Would you please bring a set for me? As you wish. My guard knights had watched the game in the playroom but hadn't played themselves, so I made them try around with the set that Cornelius owned. They were, of course, all complete beginners, and in the end, Daniel won. Cornelius looked frustrated at having lost, but Angelica did not seem to care in the slightest. She would never improve unless she had the ambition to. It seems that I would need to attach some kind of reward to this, just as I did with the children. Angelica, is there anything that you like? I asked. Angelica's eyes widened, and then she started pondering the question, wearing a more serious expression than I had ever seen on her, on her before. At times, she would furrow her brow, touching the hilt of her sword on her hip. I am willing to grant the request of everyone here else here as well, I said, looking over all those participating in the raise Angelica's grade squadron for me. This isn't supposed to be the work of a guard knight, so you may ask for a monetary boon, bonus or anything else, really. In that case, I will ask for the bonus, Daniel said with a casual smile, but Bridget put her hand on her cheek and fell into deep thought. I would like something to help Ilgnir, but nothing in particular comes to mind. I cannot even assist my province with, my, with a political marriage due to the rumors of my council's engagement. But I would at least like to help my brother, she eventually said. The look of resignation on her face made me purse my lips in frustration. She was a genuinely good person, and I wanted her to have as happy of a marriage as possible. Though, before I start butting into her life like that, I, I'll need better connections and communication skills. Definitely. Cornelius clenched his fist and asked for my sweets recipe. 
might for new sweets or recipes. He apparently wanted to bring them to his gatherings with the other knights and with students from his class so that he could start new food trends as Karstadt's son. I wasn't sure whether I should laugh at him for being such a classic archnoble or for being such a hungry boy. <laughs> Both. Very well, I shall offer Daniel a bonus of five large silvers. Cornelius, a sweet that nobody has eaten before, and Bridget, I wanted to think of something of equal value for you. We are honored. Even though, even then, neither Daniel nor Cornelius seemed to be any more motivated than they had been previously. The former was wearing a slight smile, but the latter simply murmured, yes, that should be worth it. Maybe we need to increase the reward for success a bit more. That is my compensation if Angelica fails. However, if she passes thanks to the squadron's assistance, I shall award Daniel one small gold, Cornelius, a never-before-seen recipe that has no precedence in the culinary world, and Bridget, I will make your reward comparatively more valuable as I will. Daniel and Cornelius looked visibly surprised and gazed at Angelica with the hungry eyes of carnivores that had just spotted their prey. Bridget, on the other hand, seemed largely unfazed, though I hadn't exactly given her a concrete reward to look forward to. Angelica, have you decided what you would like? I asked, turning to look at her. She knelt before me, stroked the hilt of her short sword, and then hesitantly began to speak. Lady Rosemine, can I truly ask for anything? As long as, with, as long as it is within my powers, I will do whatever I can. Angelica lowered her gaze, then looked back up at me with her eyes full of resolve. What? I would like your mana, Lady Rosemine. My mana, I asked in confusion. I'm confused too. She looked toward the short sword that she had been touching this whole time. I'm in the middle of growing this sword right now, so I would appreciate your mana, Lady Rosemont. I'm sorry, Angelica. I don't think I'm following you here. The two of us tilted our head in unison as we looked at one another. A deadly combination of Angelica being bad at explaining things and me not being very well informed about weapons, mana, and such. We might have stayed like that forever had there not been outside intervention. Lady Rose, my may I explain, Bridget asked, identifying the problem and quickly lowering, inserting herself between us. The weapon that Angelica wields is a mana blade, a sword that grows from mana. They develop a variety of attributes based on the source of said mana, be it from its owner or from others. In this regard, Angelica wishes to use yours. It seemed that one needed to pour their own mana, the mana gathered from hunting babies, and the mana from others they had negotiated with, into a mana blade to make it grow. I gave an understanding nod, fairly interested, which Angelica's eyes widened in realization. Um, Lady Rosemine, my fighting style prioritizes speed, which means I spent most of my mana enhancing my own physical strength during combat, she said, trying to de elaborate. But perhaps due to her usually being a woman of few words, I still did not understand. Daniel had to step in to translate. Remember when you observed the knight's order in battle, Lady Rosemine? Many knights transformed their staffs into to fight, but maintaining its new form requires mana. Since Angelica needs her mana to enhance her physical strength, she uses a mana blade which can have mana stored inside it in advance outside of combat. Growing her mana blade is thus essential for maximizing her potential in battle. Why not just have everyone, anyone, everyone in the Knights Order help, I asked. That would probably get the job done in a nanosecond. Daniel shook his head. Nobody gives their mana to others so easily. Mana was essential for responding to emergency summons, making fave stones died with, um, died with one's own mana, and creating un recovery potions. Daniel had a relatively small amount of mana due to being a lay noble, but not even someone like Bridget would consider giving it all away so frivolously. After all, mana was very valuable. I do m don't mind giving her some of mine, but is there something important that I need to know or look out for when doing so? Everything should be okay, as long as the amount of mana you pour into the sword does not exceed the total amount that Angelica has put in herself, but... Wait, are you serious about this? Daniel explained in shock. Yes, but remember, this reward requires Angelica to have passed all her written tests before summer. This interest had now completely vanished from Angelica's face, and her deep blue eyes were brimming with enthusiasm. She looked at me with a firm resolve, tightening her grip on her hilt. I'll pass my test and get your mana no matter what, Lady Rosemine, for the sake of both me and my sword. With this newfound motivation, Angelica, things should go just fine. Daniel ended up creating a fast-paced, highly concentrated curriculum for Angelica designed to help her pass the written classes as quickly as possible. She would learn the names of the gods and their domains through Karata, study the fundamentals of warfare using a book that Daniel's older brother, Heinrich, had transcribed, and learn to play a chess-like board game called Gwinin that required Mana to play. There would be study sessions every Earth Day when the Royal Academy closes, said Daniel, said visibly driven. It seemed like the offer of a small gold really was appealing to him. Understood, everyone? Cornelius appeared just as eager. I'll lend you my card to Angelica, so study like your life depends on it. Thank you, Cornelius, Daniel. And so the battle of the Ray's Angelica's grade squadron commenced for real.
Oh boy, here we go with spring prayer. I will see everybody in the next one.